All right. Well, thank you, Michelle, for giving us your time today. And I'm going to turn it over to you. So welcome. Great. Thank you. So, well, it is lovely to be here and I see some familiar faces I have not actually seen in a very long time. So, hey, my people, it's exciting to see you. And uh, such an honor to have Joanne ask me to, to give some time today and give a little bit of floor space for a project that's, I will say, in development. Um, because every time I was saying to Joanne, every time I tell it, I feel a bit like Robert Munch. Another piece of it seems to kind of solidify for me um, as I talk through the, the work that's been happening around holding the line. The, the material began really as a, a conversation with actually a group of healthcare social workers, uh, toughest audience I've ever had, to be honest, um, which I think was an indicator really of how folks were feeling at the time. So um, from there, it's evolved and grown into um, more of a structure, a way to work with organizations to create cultural change. Lots of organizations want to make change and lots of leaders want to be able to connect with people and create safety. But man, that's a hard thing to do sometimes, especially if we don't even know what's getting in the way. Like we can blame it on systems or processes or rules and regulations, but there are really some simple things that no matter where we are or what level we're in or what we're doing, we actually can affect some change. And so it's a, it's a marriage, I think, of um, 22 years of experience in a wide variety of places. Uh, I started doing organizational work within the military at these days, as I look at what's happening with that particular organization, it makes me incredibly sad. Um, but there, there is, uh, as a social worker in the military, you're expected to give feedback directly to leadership and sometimes leadership on a, on a base wide scale about needs in that community. And so, um, I got very good at, at recognizing micro and macro um, issues that were coming up. Social work led, it, um, lended itself really well to that perspective. So from there, working with lots of groups around strategic planning and growth and change, is, and then the incredibly um, enriched experience of working in Manitoba with Joanne and the Parenting Center team at New Directions, you know, and the life-changing work of Circle of Security uh, sort of set another layer and another layer on top of all the work that um, I had been doing. And so this is a mashup of um, organizational principles, uh, attachment work, somatic experiencing, uh, polyvagal, lots of bits and pieces from lots of places I've experienced things. Um, and my heart in all of this is in the awareness that my own experience in an organization feeling, as I say, defended on both sides, working uh, hard with hard clients and also feeling defended against the organization led to my own uh, experience of PTSD. And I don't want that to continue to happen or be status quo. Like if you choose this field, you should just, just expect that at some point you're going to burn out and fall apart. Um, that shouldn't be part of our professions. It shouldn't, it's helping professionals no matter what we do. This should not be a part of the job. But these days it feels like it's an expectation. Um, and I think there's some really simple ways we can mitigate that. So those are some of the pieces that have driven this work. I do have a PowerPoint with way too many slides. Uh, I don't feel the need to get through them all. I'll get through what we can. That's why I invited questions whenever. Um, and, uh, and we'll just see how much we get through today. I look forward to the conversation. I have no idea how to share my screen, Joanne, from here. Um, You're the host. I see the green. I see yeah, the green. The green on the bottom there. <laughs> okay, so if I share the screen. I'm used to doing this with Teams, less so with Zoom. I'm gonna try and cross my fingers. I give myself much more permission to mess up on Zoom and virtually than I ever do in person. It's nice. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can people see this? Joanne, mm -hmm. thumbs up. Good. Okay. Gonna... All right. 
So, you know, a little bit about me, Joanne gave you an introduction as to, to who I am and how do I, well, there's many other layers to me, but those are my professional pieces. Uh, I'm also a military spouse and a parent. I have a 19-year-old and a seven-year-old, which feels weird just saying even, but uh, I, I have many hats in my life. Um, the focus for today is really just to first give yourself permission to do what you need to do with your hour you've set aside for this, um, however that feels right for you. Um, and I'm glad it's recorded because sometimes people worry we're going to miss out if we take a break or walk away for a minute, but please do. Uh, we're going to walk through the underpinnings of the model, how, you know, the, the basic core, core components, as well as what underpins all of that. I'll walk you through a bit of the material that I use when I'm working with organizations. This is, I, I don't typically present on holding the line in this way. Usually it's um, a part of a larger project of sitting with an organization, having debriefs or interviews or opportunities to talk to staff. And then taking all of that and fitting it into um, the, the template we're going to talk about today. And then coming back to the organization with feedback that makes sense, some learning to give them uh, shared understanding and meaning, and then a way ahead. Um, so that's how the material we're going to go through today is usually used. So this is our, our graphic. You wouldn't believe the interesting um, pieces that have been happening for me around trying to work with a, a design person to try to figure out how do you picture this. So this is this is our model um, with five core components. The foundation of this work is collaboration, connection, clear boundaries, culture, and context. Connection is essentially knowing we have a person, that there is somebody who's there for us, that there is meaningful interconnectedness between people, um, that there's somebody there to support us in times of need, talking to an attachment network. I know I don't need to give you a lot of insight on why connection is important, but it's absolutely something I speak about as an independent piece. Collaboration, the idea of we can't do this work alone, that we are inter interconnected, and that there are particular ways that we need to be intentional about not being siloed. So easy to kind of do your job, put your head down and, and go. And so this allows us to highlight places where collaboration could happen, but may or may not be at any given moment context. You'll see some of the, the pieces here that I use um, when giving shared language. This is really, uh, a really helpful when there's a multidisciplinary team where people come from all um, walks of, of life or language. When we come together, sometimes we're literally speaking different kinds of terminology. And so having a core understanding of how relationship works, of how the brain works of how our stress responses happen, um, of how we can build self-awareness around our bodies or that feeling we have when we're around other people. And then I, I love myself a little bit of famous social worker going on and enjoy incorporating Brene Brown stuff. It's just so accessible. And so um, incorporate uh, bits and pieces of her stuff too in terms of building context. And clear boundaries. Um, it, it's imperative when we're creating workplace safety that there are very clear expectations laid out, that we understand what's going to happen if things go sideways, that, you know, we, we sometimes think about policies as being you know, our boundaries, but boundaries, interpersonal boundaries are often a challenge, even our own personal boundaries and in interacting with folks or expectations of self. So we unpack what boundaries really looks like. And so it usually when, when we're bringing this piece up, I've already sort of done the work with the team and have a sense of where some of those issues are. Always there are issues around boundaries at, at many different levels of the organization. Culture is that overarching piece. What's the vibe we want to create? Um, you know, and oftentimes, and it's not just in, in helping professions. I've worked in healthcare settings with this particular model, um, but also in educational settings and in private industry. And, you know, 
um, I talk a lot about the stress we all face and that, you know, there's sort of this, when we're at work, we're supposed to be stoic and just accept things as they are. And I think that's a load of BS. Um, I don't think we should be accepting this as part of day-to-day life. And we know there are ways to mitigate um, the impact of intense work. And so we have an obligation, I think, to, to work towards shifting a culture so that it can actually be a protective factor for people. So these are our core assumptions. We need a relationship like we need air. Simple, easy, it's a conversation as we get started around why it is so imperative and why when it's not there, we actually feel an intense amount of stress and distress in our bodies. And so we, in, in sort of thinking about um, that core relational piece, again, we're breaking down this idea that, you know, we, we leave our work life at the, or our home life at the door when we walk into the office, or that, you know, I can work independently. I don't like that word either. We are interdependent, but we talk about all those pieces. There's lots of assumptions made in our professional world about what it is to be professional. And oftentimes it kind of leaves out this piece around why relationship is so important. Belonging, the undeniable need of every human being. Trauma is everywhere, impacting all of us. And when we can understand how it shows up, how we see it, when it's visible and present in our space, we really can move from this reactive state to something more thoughtful that's more a response. Mental well-being of staff is both an individual and organizational responsibility. Sometimes people are holding their breath by the time I get to this slide. <laughs> uh, what does that mean in terms of liability? I, I just think it's an important conversation to have. And, you know, I often hear from employers about people taking individual responsibility for their mental well-being. And I say, yeah, that's absolutely necessary. And... I think there's another piece there that we need to talk about, and that's the organizational's responsibility, um, the organizational responsibility to take care of its people as well. It's, it's your most valuable asset in any organization. I don't care what you're doing. If you're selling products through Amazon or you're you know, working in a hospital, your people are your most, your most important commodity. Leadership cannot create safety without clear boundaries and expectations. And I think sometimes it's, it's, in, it's inviting and uh, an interesting conversation with leaders about when things are wishy-washy, how that actually gets felt as unsafe um, and that people can deteriorate quite quickly with huge levels of anxiety when they're not sure where's the boundary, like where's the edge of this? You know, where's my, how far can I go? What do you expect from me? If I don't know what you expect from me, how am I supposed to meet that expectation? If we know emotional safety and maintain secure relationship, it can mitigate the effects of frequent exposure to trauma, conflict, and workplace stress. Believe it or not, this is still news to lots of organizations and employers. And there's a, a really cool study that sort of, um, popped up on my radar very recently. It's a new one that actually came out of Wuhan on leadership in healthcare. And it, again, reinforcing this idea that how we lead people can actually impact their, their overall well being, even in high stress, high trauma, intense kinds of environments. I always make it a point to throw in something about resilience. And a big part of that is that resilience is like a four letter word to some people. It drives us nuts because it feels like, you know, resilience is what we're striving for, but it really just means you have to suck it up and soldier on. And again, it's not, um, it's not about our toughness. And, and if we, you know, feel like we're falling apart, if we're struggling mentally, it does not mean that it's a failure of our capacity to be resilient. It might actually just be our bodies are tired, imagine. And so this is shifting the conversation about what resilience actually is. And again, reinforcing this idea that healthy relationship is a mitigator. Healthy relationship is, is a way to support bounce back in people around 
us. And without it, people are less resilient inherently. Um, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the circle of security because you've all been there. I have a feeling many of you have, have definitely heard this work or are already committed to working within uh, attachment as you're a part of the organization. Um, I actually use the adolescent um, graphic when I'm talking about and introducing the idea of what healthy relationship is. And, and I talk about it as, yes, we can talk about parent-child relationship first, but in fact, this is a reflective of a lifelong need. We don't stop needing support. We don't stop needing a person, that secure base and safe haven. We don't stop needing that in adulthood. It's a lifelong journey. And we can actually consider how it is a workplace is supporting people out to try new things to stretch themselves. Are we actively providing people with what they need to be able to do that work? Are we catching people at that bottom of that circle? Are we meeting their needs? Do we even know what it means to organize feelings? Are we self-aware enough to understand how we're feeling in these situations? And and what are the patterns that are popping up? And I I have used and feel so grateful to the circle of security community and creators for this incredibly supportive um, graphic as a way to simplify such a complex idea. And, um, you know, even in a room full of adults who may or may not be parents, there's still something that clicks around, oh my goodness, you know, I really struggle to let people fly to let people try things, to take risk. That's a real challenge for me. Or, you know what, when my staff are really worked up and upset, you know, I shut down and close my door. I'm not necessarily able to stay with that. And sometimes that's because they're not sure how to do that, or there's not enough capacity in their own bodies and systems to be able to do that, but it opens up the dialogue. And it's a lovely way, again, to plot concerns because concerns from staff usually come up as so-and-so did this or so-and-so does that or this doesn't work for me or that doesn't work or whatever but this allows people to understand behavior as need right imagine that that would actually give us choice then on how we interact and respond this is my convoluted I'm working on another version of this. I find this a lot of words and overwhelming to kind of look at, but this is the essentially the, the um, polyvagal theory in a nutshell. Um, and I, I really simplified even further talking about how we move between, uh, between zones, the green, yellow, and red. And the version I'm looking for is less stacked the way the latter um, way that um, Porges talks about it and more the way SE lends itself that we were never with any of these stress systems off. You know, there's always some element of green, yellow, and red engaged, but they're, they vary and how they vary and what part is on in its predominance is going to impact how we take things in, how we respond in a situation, how we are coping, you know, how we, how we uh, have learned to adapt to stress in our environment. Um, and we can then also talk about what it means if, you know, our, our space of how much we can actually hold on to in terms of stress is, you know, maybe this wide, what happens if we continually work outside of that capacity, outside of that window of tolerance? And lots of us function really well out here, but not without cost to the body. So again, this starts to bring up conversation about what does it look like when someone's in a high state of um, sympathetic charge, and we can then talk about, well, what about the person who blows up at your meetings? What about the person who shuts down and freezes or isn't getting things done or struggling to get into work? Um, what about the person who never stops and you can't really feel them present any longer? They're go, 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 go. What if that was just flight, right? And what if this is not a personality flaw or an ineffectiveness in the workplace, but what if this is something we can actually raise awareness around so that 
people are self-aware enough and support around that person are self-aware enough to recognize the warning signs and be able to come alongside and support coming back down? Or what if we could engage in workplace activities that supported opportunities throughout the day for people to come out of those higher states so that we're not staying with the gas pedal stuck on all day long? Um, It informs leadership around mental health in a different kind of way. I formulate mental health less around a diagnostic manual. Uh, It serves a purpose. I understand the language, been using it for years. It's not helpful in my therapy room or when I'm working with with organizations. What's helpful is normalizing the fact that we all have the same darn systems and we all struggle in various places. And it's just a natural response to stress that lots of us have just gotten used to hanging around with, right, until it gets too high or we end up in a place where it's not functioning for us any longer. It normalizes why maybe it's hard to sit down in a meeting and be present. It recognizes why someone might not be coming to lunch to engage with other colleagues, right? It might help us understand why it's hard for someone to find, you know, a capacity for compassion in a certain situation, right? If I'm high enough up in that nervous system, these things are going to be explainable, right? We're going to understand that in a whole new way. I'm going to cross my fingers that this video plays. Um, I don't know if anyone is unfamiliar with Brene Brown. As I said, I'm a huge fan. She's the most famous social worker on the planet, which doesn't happen very often, honestly, in our field. Um, Let me know if you have a problem listening or hearing. And uh, it's a real quick little clip talking about empathy. I don't know if if it doesn't play, what you might have to do is get out a PowerPoint and, and add sound when you go to screen. I did. Chat. Okay. Perfect. I did before I went in. Yeah. Right, I'll butt out. Always looking for it. <laughs> but if it doesn't work, just give me a thumbs up, Joanne. I can see you on the bottom. So if you're hearing, let me know. <sighs> So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. (laughs) Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, (laughs) it's bad, uh uh-huh. No, you want a sandwich? (laughs) Um, Empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least I had a yeah and we do it all the time because you know what someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it I don't think that's a verb but I'm using it as one we're trying to put the silver lining around it so I had a miscarriage at least you know you can get pregnant I think my marriage is falling apart at least you have a marriage John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection.
I love that video for a number of reasons. And I think it, it well, <laughs> to quote a, a recent participant in one of my, um, in one of my trainings, it looks like it's going to be cute. And then you get hit with, whoa, like there's an intensity to the message. And it's, it's a way to actually demonstrate, I think, this idea of what it is to sort of follow with emotion, to follow along why sometimes it's hard, what shows up when it's hard, what it feels like when we're receiving something less than someone willing to kind of go down on the hole with us. I also think it's really cool as we talk about boundaries to talk about the ladder that's in that video. The bear didn't crawl down the hole with the little fox without a ladder. So I can join you in that pain and we can ride the wave together, but I know how to get out and I don't need to join you there. I can come alongside, but I have an exit strategy. So it's a lovely way again to invite conversation about boundary. Oh, I might need to end the show and, oh, there we go, okay. So holding the line, I don't think I actually introduced the, the premise of, of where that came from for me. Um, holding the line is a military reference how it came to me in a particular session, I have no idea. Uh, I was sitting with a client who was really overwhelmed with grief. And if you sat with someone's intense, unprocessed, decades-old grief, um, I mean, it was, it took up the whole room and, uh, you know, in my mind, all of a sudden, I'm just saying, hold the line, hold the line, hold the line. It was my way of stabilizing myself in that moment and trusting that just holding the line and being present was going to be what this fella needed. And, you know, later on, I was struck by like, where did that even come from? And it came from The Patriot, the movie, The Patriot. I, I don't even remember watching that movie, but I, clearly I must have. It was in my mind. I knew it was a war movie, but it's around the Civil War <laughs> in the United States. And so this picture of Mel Gibson holding the line, first I thought it was Braveheart, but it wasn't. It was The Patriot. And it's so true when we are confronted with hard emotion, man, we are holding the line. It takes a lot of energy to stay with that. And if we can know that us staying with that will lead to a lessening of that intensity, will lead to a release from that body of all of that intensity that's been stuck, man, that's powerful. And it helps us in those moments when we're sitting with that intensity to know, okay, I can do this. And there's a reason. It's going gonna, it's gonna to mean something in the end. So why is it so hard sometimes? And I like the elephant in the room idea. Uh, it is hard sometimes. And sometimes we work really hard to ignore it. <laughs> So it's like a big darn elephant sitting in the middle of organizations. And sometimes there are so many elephants in the middle of an organization, people can't breathe. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fun to talk about it in a light kind of way, but it also helps people recognize, okay, I'm not just a shitty person if it's hard to be empathic in this moment. Like there really is a reason and we can unpack these ideas of, um, you know, our, our own capacity, our own, um, it might be, might be challenged in a particular moment with our stress load. It could be that this isn't something I have a template for. I don't know what it is to have someone hold this for me. So I don't know how to hold it for you. Um, and, and we can start having, having conversations about how that impacts leadership. How does that impact our ability to lead and support others if we can't get there to, to be, to even recognize what we need to be empathic about um, or to sit there with people in those moments? Um, I always think of Joanne when I see this, and I think it's because we talked about it so much. And it's, you know, the idea of we see things as we are, um, you know, not really how they might be, is so powerful. You know, if I'm distressed, I'm going to experience the world from a state of threat. It's just going to be that way. 
So if I'm not aware of where I am in my nervous system, I might actually be looking at what's going on, believing this internal story I'm telling myself, this internal process. And so some of the things I hear are things like, I don't get respected, or that person's out to get me, or I don't feel appreciated, or um, I'm bothering people when I share my concerns. No one wants to be near me. No one trusts me. The walls have ears. It can almost sound to others as sort of a, a state of paranoia. It isn't a state of paranoia. It's a state. Of, it's a stress state. And if we're in a highly stressed state, we we are receiving information into that primitive part of our brain, that nervous system, at, at a stressed state. So we're already in a state of threat and everything else is going to feel that way. And so our coping strategies, our ways of making sense of that are going to come through. The brain loves, there's a piece in Brene Brown's Dare to Lead where she talks about how the brain loves to complete things, complete stories. No kidding, right? We want to know all the pieces. And so whether we know them to be truth or not, we make it up because we want to have the whole story. So these are some of the things that pop up in, in regular dialogue uh, within organizations. These are things that I hear all the time, and you've probably heard or thought these things yourself. Again, not because there's something wrong with you, but because that's where your stress state was. That's where it led you. Um, I very much move through all the work I do in an experiential kind of way. I evoke motion intentionally when I'm working with groups of people so that we can model and work with things in real time. And what stands out to me, one of the, the pieces I absolutely love about Circle of Security is the being with exercise. Um, so in a, in a play on that being with exercise and it's sort of expanding the emotional variety to choose from with a group of adults, um, I pulled this, this list from, um, the whole brain child Dan Siegel and, and Tina Bryson's work. There are a million and one lists on emotions, but I wanted something that was a little fuller for a workplace to be able to pull apart things that people talk about and think about on a regular basis. So I invite participants participants to, to really think about what's your experience throughout your life with receiving empathy in these areas. You know, and as an adult, there's a potential for earn secure. So it might be that there's a spouse or a partner or a good friend or somebody who's backfilled some of these pieces, pieces for us, but it ultimately results in people reflecting on childhood, people reflecting on, on adulthood and, and what parts can be, can be flags. What, where do I get hooked? You know, which ones are, are likely to hook me within myself and within the people within my organization? What are the, what are the emotions that tend to, tend to, to hook me the most so that I feel like I'm, I'm lost? I don't really know what to do in those situations. Then we talk about sophisticated management strategies, because as adults, we have really learned far more than the toddler uh, how to hide stuff really, really well. And we've learned how to manage not getting our needs met in a way that protects us, right? These are self-protective strategies. And so uh, we, we open up a conversation about the different kinds of sophisticated management strategies. And by the time I'm sitting with a team, I have a pretty good idea how they're popping up across the board. Um, we talk about the elephants and how we might avoid those things. We talk about numbing strategies. Um, we talk about uh, the, the go, go, go. When I get stressed, I hit the gas pedal you know, and then everybody else is riding this intensity with me, which happens a lot in leadership um, conversations. Control, micromanaging, these are all sophisticated management strategies. They're really simple to understand if we think about them in context of relationship, trying to access what we need, how we've learned how to cope with that, and how we've learned to cope with our own stress and our own internal stress systems. Um, so we literally pull apart fight, flight, freeze, and how do they show up? How do they show up in my day-to-day -day life at home and at work? How do I know when I'm seeing them in a colleague? So now I have a little bit more understanding and maybe a little bit more access to empathy. 
right, in those situations, because I can recognize now that behavior is not just, you know, this annoying thing my colleague does, but now it's a something I can recognize and say, oh, I know what that is. That's that sophisticated management strategy we've talked about. And it's there for a reason. And if we know about it and we're aware, we can seek to work towards something different. When we understand the underlying emotions and experiences driving complex behavior, we can shift from reacting in crisis to responding with a measure of confidence. And this isn't just within the, the collective employee group within an organization, but sometimes it's important even with the people we're interfacing with, particularly in healthcare, where you can get met with a whole variety of people coming in through the door. Um, and not just in that environment, lots, but you know, it can be really confusing and overwhelming if I don't understand even what filter to run this through to know what they need to begin with. So it's, an, again, another way to give people something firm to stand on, right? There's something solid here. The final pieces, these are just sort of uh, how we're, how um, each of these components is kind of connecting back to the rest of what we talked about learning to hold the line and not fix and solve people's intense emotions is hard but necessary skill. Um, it's ultimately our capacity to understand emotion, our self understanding, our ability to see patterns as they play out in front of us. These things all give us capacity to be able to mitigate the intensity of people's work. Delivering quality service product is not a one-person job. Collaborative practice is absolutely necessary. And healthy relationships and teams leads to better communication, clarity, creativity, effective problem solving, and innovation. A clear map of understanding behavioral behavior as emotional need helps us in even the most complex situations. And it's been such a helpful tool for some um, healthcare providers who didn't have that lens to be able to say, oh, that's what's happening with that family, or that's what's happening with that parent and why they're struggling when they come in in that way, or why something isn't resolving, because we're no longer just attending to the behavior. We're actually recognizing the depth underneath that. Each piece of the foundation fits together with the rest and without clear boundaries, there is no emotional safety. There is no emotional safety without clear boundaries. I cannot say that enough. Um, a lack of emotional safety breaks down relationships, connection and collaboration and creates a toxic culture of fear. Cultural shift must take place for staff to be to prioritize themselves. We have a large culture that seeks to promote individualism. It seeks to promote that we must push, 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 push to continue to advance and grow and change and, 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 and. And the reality is, especially these days, man, we're tired. Uh, and somebody needs to say, it's okay to take a knee. And it really is because eventually, it, your, your body will take it anyway, whether you want to or not. But we don't talk about that and we don't normalize that as professionals, we're supposed to continue to push through. And that's not the reality, right? There is a huge cost to that pushing through. I've learned that lesson the hard way too many times. If we know we're not alone in our struggle, we can reach for support without shame. Man, that's a constant reminder to myself about why I do the work I do, why I tell my story the way I do. I've done a lot of work to be able to tell my story. I don't feel like I'm spraying people, but I absolutely want to normalize. I really believe every good therapist has a therapist. I, you know, whether that's your best friend over coffee or somebody you're paying out of pocket or whatever that might be, you know, we cannot do that alone. And to carry the burden of the work that we do by ourselves is, is not a helpful thing for us or the people around us, or the people we work with, right? 
It leads me into these ideas and conversations about self-compassion, which for some fields is, and it's been interesting in private industry to, to sort of see people go, what, what are you talking about? And, and it is an interesting concept, the idea of self-compassion. What does that actually look like? So we're not talking self-care, like getting a massage, although that's lovely. We're talking about self-compassion. And when we're talking about self-compassion, now we're talking about what happens if I screw it up? What happens if I make a wicked mistake? Can I be okay with making mistakes? If I can't be okay with making mistakes, I'm going to really struggle to learn. And if I have a boss who really struggles with mistakes for themselves, I'm not going to feel safe to make mistakes. So again, we have more and more conversation about what does it actually mean to have self-compassion? What does that actually look like when it hits the road? For me, it's about giving myself permission to not do all the things and then some days to just cancel all my clients or to take a month off. Or in the last year, it's been radical self-care with osteopaths and chiros and physios and exercise and you know, huge chunks of time off and all the things that I just need to be able to do the work that I do. Hope for healing comes from shared connection. What if we didn't have to work harder? What if cultural change, real change within organizations didn't have to mean working harder? What if we could do the work, but just do it differently? You know, what if that actually resulted in healing happening at work? What a novel concept, healing happening at work. What do I actually need to feel good enough? What changes or process would help me to do that? Who fills my cup? Love that expression from COS. How do I connect with people? Am I connecting with people? Maybe I'm so far up into my nervous system, that's really hard right now. But if we don't ask the question, we won't know. This is just a little reminder that, you know, even in those crazy times, there is hope and, you know, the light of compassion is really within all of us. And that every person you ever meet has infinite worth. Love Kent Hoffman. He inspired so much in me. As a way to kind of finish up this piece and, and then move into some conversation with people, I see there's some stuff in chat I haven't um, I haven't looked, so I'll do that when I finish. Um, I was just sort of thinking the other night about all the things that you know, any of us who are working frontline, and I suspect most of you are in some way, whatever that field might be, um, you're watching the things happening around us. You're watching the polarizing happening around us and the stress and it, the intense fear everywhere. And, you know, I, I like to give people um, an opportunity of feeling seen and felt in some way with a large group that's challenging. So this is just my version of, of doing that. It's all you've got to just be strong And it's a fight just to keep it together Together I know you think that you are too far gone But hope is never lost Hope is never lost Those nights, but you 
beautiful piece of music is Brian and Ben uh Brian and Jen Johnson and uh the album is after all these years put it by Bethel music I love it and wherever you are and whatever it is you're doing these days in this work that you're doing um I think I just wanted to remind you that you're not alone in this crazy thing we're doing these days that uh, there are like-minded people fight in the fight there too and you know there with every trauma there is traumatic growth there's a light at the end of this crazy tunnel and maybe it's just going to be people recognizing we can't do things as we've always done them but um my hope is that we will we will get there together so I don't know whether to go through the chat or to, I'll open up the floor if there's questions or curiosities or. I would just say thank you. It was a beautiful way to spend lunch to <laughs> recognize the difference we can make while being compassionate. Just uplifting thanks so much michelle i'm so glad i joined today <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad i'm so glad yeah we just have to bring ourselves right and our willingness to connect mm -hmm. and, I, and i look forward to the powerpoint hopefully we can get it hey joanne because there's so many nice little quotes and stuff in there that i feel like i can reflect on that i i didn't keep taking notes the whole time I think if you're posting the video, you'll have access that way to, to what's on those slides, too, if you want to watch it back later. Yeah. Hmm. Charlie suggested that you write a book, Michelle. It's on my to-do list, Charlie. <laughs> Damn list just keeps growing. <laughs> <laughs> This is, this is one of my two big passions, the organizational piece. I think I'm sorting out my own stuff from my, my career and the other piece is um, early medical trauma and attachment. So I haven't quite figured out which one I'm gonna sit with long enough to put something on paper, but those are my two pieces. <laughs> so great, thank you. Perfect way to spend a lunch hour, that's for sure. Good. Thank you. I'd be up for a full day conference. 
or more training, Joanne, like this. This is great. Yeah. Uh, Michelle. Yes. You know what I wrote in quotes, and I just shared it to the gram, and I tagged you. You're back on mute, Amber. Oh. I'm back. I'm back. Um, but when you start with a quote, burnout should not be an expectation of the of a profession. Like I almost picture it with emojis with the hand clap in between everyone. Like burnout should not be an expectation. And I think when you start off and you frame it like that, it like it it just hits you with such a punch. Because I think so many of us are operating with the assumption that we're just bound to become burned out. It's just part of our lives, our jobs. So when you're forced to question that premise, then other, those other things just fall away. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Sometimes when we question that, people go, what? Then what? Like, what do I do now? If that's not what's supposed to happen, how do I stop? And if I stop, what if that creates a bigger stress response in me, right? It's an interesting conversation. And why why do we accept that this is the expectation of our field of choice yeah it's crazy yeah thanks before we let michelle go does anybody have any uh questions further that uh, that you'd want michelle to elaborate on Michelle, can I can I just make a comment for one moment? Mm -hmm. I just I'm hoping you got a chance to see Charlie's magnificent quote, his chat. I'll just read it because I was hoping he would. He said, Michelle Ken Hoffman would be so proud and pleased with what you've created. And that's just so beautiful. And um, it, it was just so powerful and, and thank you. And I could speak for hours. And one thing I just wanted to wonder with you. The name of your of your program is so beautiful, um, it, and I wonder if you've ever sort of explored the hold the line as in the Anden Court in lean manufacturing. Is that is that familiar to you? No. So I just think it might be something that 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 might um, land for you because it's a, it's a concept in Toyota manufacturing, which is the the whole yes. basis of lean manufacturing. That when something is wrong you pull the and on court, you hold the line, you stop. And I just, I just think that that's just so um, powerful with all that you shared with us today. And it, it, you know, it's just so resonant with all the work in psychological safety. It's just beautiful. And thank you. And thank you. And thank you. Ah, oh, you're, you're welcome. You, you got me on the thing from Charlie's letter. I, I have a huge heart for Kent Hoffman. I, I can honestly say he changed my life in the way he held space with COS. Uh, just such a tremendous gratitude. And um, I think I think holding the line for me is is the work and the hard and the awesome all in one. It, it's it's the thing we're called to do, but it's important to remember we're not holding it alone because we can hold a line all by ourselves. And man, that's a heck of a lot of weight to carry. Yeah. Yeah. And you held us all so beautifully today. Thank you for that. My pleasure. That's the stuff I get off on. I love it. <laughs> that's the stuff that boosts my energy. <laughs> my pleasure. I'm so glad. I know you're all from all over and I know you're all doing hard work too. And uh, that, that made the whole hour worth it. You know, Michelle, I've been thinking of um, this last year and a half as the most unique experience we'll ever have in our lives to have a collective experience that's shared around an entire planet. But I have a feeling this afternoon that we've also had a very strong collective experience here with you today as well. And, um, and you're right, a lot of us know this material on lots of different levels. Um, your application of it, uh, I think it just gives us so much hope uh, as a way of navigating through and hopefully out someday of, a, of what the pandemic has, has uh, created for us. But also what, what was kind of there before in our in our organizational cultures and, and, you know, even lifting off of Amber's comment about burnout shouldn't just be the expectation that you either, either fizzle out or you burn out. Mm -hmm. um, 
So thank you so much for the fresh take on, on perspective, the gentleness, the, your approach. Um, yeah, and I have a feeling that we're all gonna be very productive this afternoon because our cups are all quite full right now. Either that or you'll need a nap, one of the huh. others. Either <laughs> one is good. All the permission to whatever you need <laughs> after this.